Hi, I'm Hans Florin, aka Hollywood Hans, world famous American rock climber. Hi, I'm Camille Heron, aka Fly Camille. I'm an ultra runner, a coach, and a multiple world record holder. <laughs> Hi Camille, great to be talking with you today. Hi Hans, it's great to be chatting with you as well. I'm gonna say gym cardio for this then, I think. What do you do Camille, strength training? Strength training. We'll see who has the lower heart rate for the session. <laughs> but Camille, you must probably got your heart rate down at 70 or something when you're running these races and you can chat with people as you pass by them, no? Yeah, uh, I, I think about the 24-hour the uh, world championship here two years ago, uh, I mean, I'm in that race with, you know, the former 24-hour world record holder, and, um, and I laughed her several times in the race, and, um, but, you know, I'm trying to encourage her, and, um, I mean, she was able to get on the podium and everything, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I feel like, I, I think it's the coolest thing. I mean, I, like, I don't, I, I feel like we're all in it together and we understand the importance of, you know, trying to elevate the sport and elevate the records. And, um, I mean, I feel like I'm, you know, a friendly and positive person that, um, yeah, even though, you know, I might be lapping the former world record holder that, um, I mean, she's there, she's there and she's encouraging me and I'm encouraging her and we're just trying to be the, the best athletes that we can be. So this just recently happened, right? Yeah, so the when I set my uh, my most recent 24-hour uh, world record, it was two years ago. So it was just before the pandemic, uh, and I set it at the World Championship. So it was like a, a who's who of women's ultra running was there, and um, and so yeah, it was really cool because you know I'm in a race with you know the the all stars of you know women's ultra running, and so it was it was really cool. Like I. I grew up as a basketball player, so I always thought of myself as being like Michael Jordan and, you know, being a championship runner. And so, you know, I brought my A game to that race. Uh, and obviously, you know, I'm trying to push myself, but at the same time, like, I want to see the other women in the race succeed. So I'm cheering them on and we're, you know, we, we see each other's struggles when you're, when, when you're on a, 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 a loop course that you're having to run, you know, hundreds, hundreds of times that, um, you see each other's high points, you see each other's struggles, but you're trying to encourage each other, you know, to push your human limits and to be the best that you can be. So, uh, it's, it's really cool. Yeah. With, with setting the world records and and um, especially being able to do it at a world championship where you're there with all the other best in the world. So. Yeah. I'm seeing just how crazy different that is from me passing somebody on El Cap is, you know, imagine somebody out <laughs> walking their dog, a 90 year old woman walking their dog around the track and you pass them by and you say, hey, nice dog you got there. That's, <laughs> that's the equivalent of me passing someone on El Cap. They're not even in the race with you. These people are camping out on El Cap for three days hauling hundreds of pounds of gear and portal edges and, and I pass them by and can talk to them, but it's not, they're in the same game as me, so to speak, you know? Yeah. We don't have those head to head, I guess, we're going for climbing records at the same time, you know, with the exception of World Cup and Olympic speed climbing things, which I haven't done for over a decade, but. Uh, well, you know, th this is a quote that Tommy Caldwell says that I said, apparently, you know, for every place I beat you, you owe me one dollar, right? And I think that's the, perhaps he, I might have been caught at the height of my competitive cockiness, if you will, from old sports coming into things. And that was probably said at Snowbird, which was, you know, early 90s when competition was young. And I was, I was trying to learn my place in the community and stuff. And I, I, I kind of figured around the bend that I was being a little bit too goofy mental gaming with people um in the climbing world or certainly the competitive climbing world but my point was really just to inspire people to like oh yeah i'm gonna beat that guy haunts and if they did beat me i'd be like way to go you know i wouldn't be like here's your money and hanging my head down or whatever um it was it was my odd way to inspire them like i'm gonna beat that guy haunts you know yeah i i can relate to the the whole betting money part uh, <laughs> when i when i set my first 24-hour world record uh, the, there's uh, there's a guy named Joe Fiji's in ultra running and um, that he bet money against me and uh, if, if you really want to fire me up uh, bet bet against me 
so I, I felt like I was really going to show, show Joe up, and, uh, and so he didn't think I was going to break the world record. I was going up against a bunch of other, I think I was ranked like fifth or something going into that, that race, and, um, and so, yeah, I ended up setting the 24-hour world record, and uh, Joe had to donate money to a charity uh, that I picked, and so uh, that, that was pretty cool. <laughs> nice. You know, that really is um, all about doing what they say can't be done. And I think climbers exactly. as a group love doing that. You know, you can't climb a grade six, the nose in a day. Oh, yeah, we can. Or you can't climb that face over there, whether it's, you know, a sport route or a large mountain. Oh, yeah, I can. It's doing what they said couldn't be done. You're motivated kind of the same way I am, Camille. Yeah. What, what is it about you that makes you such a great climber? Well, uh, my dad was six foot two and thin as a rail. Um, he was an Iowa corn farmer. And, uh, well, his parents were, I guess. He, he went immediately into school and became a veterinarian. Um, and my mom, you know, my, I'm older than you. And so my parents, they didn't have Title IX when my uh, mom went to school. But she often mentions that, that had women's sports been more accepted, she would have just kicked butt at everything. They probably had only softball for her when she was in college and high school, but she's an amazing athlete, very healthy. She's 88 years old now. Um, and I'm six foot one. And I shouldn't say that, you know, that's what's kind of cool about climbing is that there's five foot, there's five foot even women that win world championships and there's six foot one men that win world championships. So that alone, just my tall thin structure isn't a gimme that you're going to do well in climbing but for me um, that strength to weight ratio has been great and I've never had a problem keeping my weight down or where it's at I guess um, I've weighed 158 pounds plus or minus five pounds for 30 years and um, <laughs> that sort of nature gift to me has uh, been super helpful in climbing I did track and field, I did crazy event, the pole vault, and even did decathlon my last year. So I tried to dabble to see what I was good at. And, you know, just like all kids, I climbed furniture in the living room and I climbed trees. Um, I didn't learn about climbing until I was in college. And when I did, I didn't like all of a sudden go to the top of the world or anything uh, or any hard routes. I just went out and I really loved the sort of, you have this quiver of, gear on you and you go out and I can go up that terrain over there was kind of the interesting thing to me but I think a couple of years into climbing once I saw that there was numbers and then a quantitative way to, to um, see how hard you could climb I was instantly like well let's see you know how many routes in a day I could do and you know I started making Lotus 123 sheets which you have to be pretty old to know that that's pre Excel <laughs> which some people don't even know what that is. That's, you know, Google Sheets, basically. But I would start categorizing and numbering and timing how long I could do routes and how fast I could do routes. And I think just my whole thing about numbers, keeping track of how many climbs I did and logging climbs I got, um, did a lot of nurturing, I guess, of the gifts I had already given, been given, I guess. Um, I definitely got to cre credit my parents for giving me good genes because um, I'm built um, like my dad. I'm really tall. I grew up as a basketball player. And so I think I just naturally developed my endurance through basketball and being a point guard. Uh, and so I did most of the running on the team um, as a point guard, bringing the ball down the court and, uh, you know, people chasing me around the court and such. So um, I think I just got my, my athletic uh, height and my arms and my legs from my dad. Uh, but I got to credit my mom with getting my endurance because she, she was a swimmer. And I laughed because um, I almost drowned when I was like three. And so I ended up not becoming a swimmer because I was so afraid of the water after that incident that um, I pretty much wanted to stick with land. So, um, so yeah, if you want to talk about the most amazing, <laughs> you know, life changing things, I, I basically got propelled into land sports because I almost drowned and didn't become a swimmer like my mom. But, um, but yeah, I, I obviously, you know, had discovered my uh, ability for endurance, you know, by running the shorter 
uh, track and field and um, all the way up to the marathon. Uh, but when I, when I tried ultra running and committed myself in 2015, um, like, I, like I said, you know, it just felt like I was born for that. Um, I just felt like once I got beyond the marathon and got beyond 50 miles that I, I could just keep going. <laughs> so, so did you drop basketball or how late in life did you go continuing with basketball? I basically continued with basketball until the eighth grade. And it was when I went out for cross country season as an eighth grader and running on the natural terrain that um, I felt like I felt like I did as a kid running around the wheat fields by our house. Uh, that cross country just felt so easy and natural to me, and I felt like. Uh, I remember going to my first cross country race and all the other little girls looked like me. They were all like <laughs> string beans. <laughs> and, uh, so, so being a basketball player, like, um, I mean, I was always, I was a bit undersized when I played basketball and I didn't get my height until I got into high school. Yeah. Uh, but at that point, I, I had already quit playing basketball when I got my height, but I was a full-fledged runner. Um, and, and really, it was just cross-country that made me fall in love with the sport. And, um, and yeah, I mean, I, uh, I was a very good marathoner, um, but it was when I started to go much, much further. Uh, like I said, running my first 100K, uh, I started catching them in. And, um, and they were, it just, it was like they were tired during the race and I wasn't tired. And um, I just had this endless amount of energy in me um, that, you know, if, if you had to test my, my muscle fibers, I'm probably like 99% slow twitch muscle fibers. <laughs> so uh, the marathon just was, ne it was just too short for me. I had to go much, much further beyond the marathon to, to find that this is what I'm born to do. So, so you know, this is a, a, a dreadful, seems like it's a blatant plug, but like, as you know, when I started in the 80s, we didn't, we didn't have the internet, we didn't have Google Sheets, we had Lotus 1, 2, 3, we had pencil and paper. I have so many pencil and paper notebooks of how many routes I climbed different days and stuff. And you know, with technology and of course the Koros global um, watches, it's just been crazy. I can upload stuff and see my whole year, like did I do more biking than last year? Did I do more swimming than last year? Did, you know, or last month, right? And so, I mean, I have a community of people, we kind of see our leaderboard of who's climbed more hours this month or swam or, and that stuff just keeps me psyched. You know, we talk about nurture um, and positive competition. You can, you can keep track of all this stuff so well with a Koros watch and link to Strava and connect with your friends and whatever platform you use, it just makes it so easy to motivate yourself. I've seen people post since she's the 90s even like what they're doing and I've seen end of year letters from people, oh, I ran so many miles this year and you're like, how did they how did they figure that out? How did they log that in 1999, you know? So I've been a runner since 1995. Ooh. And back then, um, we used to go, I, I guess, um, like my coach would go drive courses. And so we would say we're going to run, you know, four miles. Um, or my dad would drive around the block and be like, oh, it's, you know, half a mile. Yeah, yeah. So we, we didn't have GPS, you know. It was running pretty, you know, standardized, you know, measured distances with your car. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, most, most of my... Um, most of my running career was just track, you know, running standardized, measured, you know, measured with your car distances, or I would, you know, estimate what my pace was, um, you know, paper and pen. I've, I have years and years of training logs of, you know, just paper and pen and um, estimating my pace that, you know, I ran for different, you know, easy runs versus workouts. And so, um, Really, the whole the whole GPS thing is something that I haven't really grabbed onto until I became an ultra runner, and um, and so you know going into going into the sport in 2015, uh, there was a limitation on watches and GPS, and I found that um, when I started going for my world records for 12 hours and 100 miles back in 2017, that my my watch that I had at that time went into power save mode. <laughs> yeah. Wait, you mean I don't get any data after eight hours? Like, what the heck? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so let's talk about this. And I'll just, I'm trying not to plug my book, but this just does it so well, right? 
um, yeah. than those of El Cap or our outdoor nature and stuff. And I want to say, you know, that I love the movement of climbing and I have to guess that Camille loves the movement of running. So if it's on a rubberized official Olympic track or something, <laughs> the movement of running is still super cool to cover that ground, right, yeah. Camille? You know, I'm, I'm in love with the movement. I'm in love with what my body can do, whether it's a flat track, you know, running all day on a flat track. And that I know, I know that I'm pushing the human limits when I'm going for world records on a flat track. And, and for me, it feels like being a superhero and I'm like, and I'm like, I'm like flying close to the sun and I start to feel like I'm like, my cape is burning. And, <laughs> and, <laughs> and, it, and, you know, I feel that pain. I feel that pain and I'm continuing to hold it, you know, right at that feeling that that sun, you know, burning my cape and I'm trying to endure that feeling. Um, and, and knowing that I'm going to raise the bar, I'm going to push the human limits. And so for me, I mean, I love that feeling that I have, you know, when I'm on a track and then, you know, being able to apply it to natural terrain and be on trails and be on mountains and being able to go vertically uh, with my legs that I, you know, that uh, I think Bill Bowerman is the one that says that if you have a body, you're an athlete. And yes. so... Being able to take my two legs and go up a mountain and go, you know, as fast as I can on natural terrain, and that I, I love that. A lot of people ask me because I'm known for speed, like, don't you ever stop and smell the roses? Um, and I'm like, <laughs> Camille could run <laughs> in, you know, whatever, a 16 mile backpacking thing in and out in whatever, a few hours, where someone would take two days to backpack in there and stuff. Well, you just get to see more roses, right? And you get to see roses exactly. at the end of that 16 or 20 miles in that you wouldn't have got to see if you weren't in a hurry, I guess, rushing around, running around, <laughs> right? I remember there was one time I was running a race at uh, Tarawera in New Zealand, and I, I laughed because I, I happened to look down and I saw like a coin from New Zealand, and I, I stopped to pick up the coin. <laughs> Well, thank goodness it wasn't super glued down as a joke on you or something. But yeah, I mean, I like, I definitely, I, I definitely have, you know, um, snapshots in my head when I go do these amazing like trail races and the scenery. And um, usually what I try to do is I try to run on these trails, like, you know, the couple days before so that I can get the pictures. You know? Yeah, there you go. Uh, <laughs> I ran by this or but I took the picture the day before or the day after, yeah. yeah. You know, to the, your point about saying that everybody's an athlete is, I feel really appreciative, and someday you'll get to this point, Camille, but that I, I was good enough at something, whether it's pole vaulting or soccer or running, or that I considered myself an athlete, and therefore I pushed and learned what it feels like. I mean, it feels way different, right, to be in the flow after six, seven hours of running than just to go out for a two mile run. And what I'm getting at is people who think they're not an athlete, they may never go and push themselves to that flow state, you know. Um, yeah. Just two days ago, I did a mountain bike ride, which is not my uh, sport, I guess. And I pushed so hard right at sunset in nature around Lake Tahoe and trying to stay with my roommate who's a gifted skier and a better aerobic mountain bike athlete than me and I, and I pushed so hard to be with him not because I believed I was an athlete but that I just knew it would feel really good to push really hard yeah I I haven't always been good at every sport that I've tried but like every time I've tried a sport like I have thought this feels good you know the movement feels good and so like we say, you know, having, if you have a body, you're an athlete and it doesn't matter, you know, how good or how bad you're at something that you can learn to appreciate that movement and how it makes you feel and trying to, you know, find, trying to push yourself to get better at something that, and, you know, I, I, I may not be the, the strongest person. I may not have, you know, all muscles in my upper body, but I love to work out in the gym. <laughs> I love to like lift weights and I like how it makes my body feel and um, yeah, maybe I'm not going to be squatting like hundreds of pounds, but at the same time, like I can, you know, get stronger with my legs and learn how to be a better squatter. So Camille, going from our enjoyment of taking our sport and movement to the outdoors, um, let's talk about something maybe not so wonderful. How about injuries? 
So yeah, just just talking about myself, and uh, I do laugh that uh, you, you'd have to wrap me in bubble wrap before races because I have a tendency to have like freak accidents happen to me. And um, and uh, but yeah, I mean, there's obviously dangers with my sport. There's uh, dangers, you know, in just regular life that I've dealt with. I've had um, I was involved in a rollover car accident back in 2019. Um, and I remember being trapped in my car, upside down in my car, and thinking I could die right now. Like, how do I get out of my car? Um, and it actually, when I had my car accident, it was six weeks after I had set my 24-hour world record. And so I remember being in my car and thinking, well, this is my life. Like, this is how my life is going to end, potentially. Um, and I remember um, when I was able to get out of my car and thinking, I get to live. Like, I appreciate my life. Thank goodness I'm alive, you know. And that was a really life-changing moment for me that I realized that I'm alive. I still get to continue on, you know, setting records and, you know, doing what I'm born to do. And, um, and so I ended up, uh, at the time, I had a day job and I ended up quitting my day job and uh, fully committed myself to the sport and being able to be the best athlete that I can be. Um, and so, you know, I, that, that car accident really changed my mindset that I had that, uh, that, you know, we only get to live once in our life and we might as well be the best that we can be while, while we have our time here on earth. So I, I brought props because I, I need little crushes to talk <laughs> with. This is my exosim from the, the hangar clinic. Um, and I, <clears throat> I'm not wearing it right now, obviously. I, I, I need to wear it if I'm walking, hiking longer than 15, 20 minutes. Um, but I fell uh, climbing on El Cap. Uh, I would hold up my little prop, but I was 2,000 feet up. I fell about 16 feet and hit a little ledge, broke my tib fib on my left leg and broke my heel into a bunch of pieces on my right. So um, not a good place. To, no, there's no good place to break your legs, but um, that was pretty epic. And helicopter came in the next morning and hauled me off and all that. But um, I, you know, just this is the technical detail of description of it, but um, you know, I was in a wheelchair for two months and then a knee scooter for two months and then crutches for a couple months and then was walking, you know, basically seven months later. And my arms got really big in the wheelchair. I always like kind of focus on the positive and my core got really strong. I did lots of sit-ups and push-ups and lots of that wheelchair stuff. And you know, I don't, I don't know that in that moment I go, oh, my life of climbing is over. I, I, I've, I'm in this strange world where I've helped so many disabled people from deaf folks to blind people to people paralyzed from the waist down to people. Uh, I've worked a lot with wounded warriors that are missing limbs and it would be, you know, pathetic for me to whine about, oh, I have two broken legs, my life's over, because all of my kind of community of people, like, they're like, Hans, you're a normie, come on, get with it, you finally get to uh, have a, uh, not a handicap, but something that, you know, will challenge you more than just a regular human body, I guess, and so um, your, you know, your accident in the car, I, I see a lot of people, like, have those, and, like, they come back stronger from it, you know, because you're, like, woken up that like, this is it. It's not a rehearsal. It's your one chance, right? I'm going to quit my day yeah. job and commit to this thing. <laughs> I, I've, I've found with a lot of people, I, I've tried to, I go around and speak to folks and I'm like, hey, you know, look at Eric Wyamere, who's blind. He's going up this talus slope and it takes him five times as long as you or me to walk up this talus because he's got to feel his way up. And you should be inspired to go do something without having to be in a car crash or without having yeah. to lose your sight or you know why don't you get motivated and so yeah i mean fortunately for me i think that i've held the record on the nose of el cap because i was surrounded by these people that had crises and i didn't have a physical crisis i learned from them i guess and i'm like i'm gonna go out and I'm gonna get up at 3 a.m. in the morning and i'm gonna train at the gym for four hours before i go to an eight hour day job you know um, yeah. Those type of things, you know, uh, just I, I learned from others, and now you know, not apparently enough. I went and had to break my own legs, but um, wow, 
Yeah, yeah, I, I have a really good quote uh, because I, I've had to overcome a lot of injuries in my career and a lot of uh, just life moments, you know, like with my car accident. And uh, back when I was a, in high school, my family lost their home to a tornado. Um, uh. And so I feel like, I feel like all those, all those, uh, so the, the favorite quote that I have is every setback is a setup for a comeback. And so nice. it's hard, it's hard to see, it's hard to see the light. Like when you have that setback, like it's hard to imagine, you know, coming back, but then when you do come back, like, and you're back on top and, um, you can appreciate everything that you had to go through and persevere through to get back on top. And so I've been through so many challenges in my running career that every time I have a setback, I just know that I'm going to come back and, you know, get back to being the athlete that I am. And, um, and so, so, yeah, I mean, I feel like I've used those life challenges in a positive way to, to go on to continue to do amazing things. And, um, I mean, that's, I, I say that running is a great metaphor uh, for life. And that, you know, kind of what you go through in life, you go through challenges in running as well. And so, you know, they kind of work together that you learn how to work through those challenges <laughs> as a runner uh, to continue on. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a journey basically, so. Well, it looks like we're out of time here or close to out of time. Um, just want to say what a great, fun pleasure it was talking with you, Camille. And I, I hope that uh, I can get you up on El Capitan sometime for a run up that. <laughs> I, I don't know how I feel about the whole climbing, but maybe I can take you for a trail run <laughs> at Yosemite Park. Um, I've actually been there, and I, I would love to come back and, uh, you know, maybe maybe run a, around the mountains rather than up the mountains. <laughs> Are we going to stop watches now? And then... <laughs> Ready? Camille, one, two, three, and stop. <laughs>